Hello everyone, I'm Katie Contos and welcome to today's webinar which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st Century. Today's webinar is focused on the global renewable energy transformation, what is holding us back. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, if you have you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having any technical difficulties with this webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-32 for assistance. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type it in. The audio recording and presentations will be posted to the Solutions Center training page within a few days of the broadcast and will be added to the Solutions Center YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars as well as interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center Resource Library as one of many best practice resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's agenda is centered around the presentation from our guest panelist, Rana Adib, who has joined us to discuss an overview of REN's, REN21's newly released renewables 2018 Global Status Report. Before we jump into the presentations, I'll provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Then following the panelist presentation, we'll have a, get, a question and answer session where Rana will address questions submitted by the audience. At the end of the webinar, you'll be automatically prompted to fill out a brief survey as well. So thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond. The Solutions Center was launched on, in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. 24 countries in the European Commission are members contributing to 90% of clean energy investment and responsible for 75% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. This webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which focuses on helping the government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through support in crafting and implementing policies related to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as this webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, Sweden, and United States with in-kind support of the government of Chile. The Solutions Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 ex global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, no-cost virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy topics, partnership building with development agencies and regional and global organizations to deliver support, and an online library containing over 5,500 clean energy policy-related publications, tools, and videos and other resources. Our primary audience is made up of clean energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive with, um, to engage with private sector, NGOs, and civil society. The Solutions Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across a suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above and include resource organizations like IRENA, NIEA, and programs like se for all and regional-focused entities such as EQUAT, Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. A marquee feature the Solutions Center provides is a no-cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with more than 60 global selected um, expert, excuse me, 60 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area area of energy access, we are very pleased to have Alexander Och, CEO of SD Strategies, serving as one of our experts. If you need a policy assistance in energy access or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, this assistance is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our online, our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word 
about the service in your networks and organizations. Now I'd like to provide a brief introduction for today's speaker. Today's speaker is Rana Adib, the uh, exe Executive Secretary of Renewable Energy Policy Network uh, for the 21st Century, which is REN21. Previously, Rana was REN21's Research Coordinator, developing the international expert community and leading the REN21 Renewables Global Status Report series to become an international reference. She has over 20 years of experience in international sector, and we're glad to have her as our expert panelist today. And with that brief introduction, I'd like to welcome Rana to the webinar. Rana? And it looks like your mic is still on mute. Oh yes, excuse me. Thank you very much, Katie, for the um, introduction and also for the opportunity to present the Renewables Global Status Report. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good day, good evening. Um, I'm very excited. I hear that you have many people on the other side of the screens. And um, actually, I'm going to present you the results of the Renewables 2018 Global Status Report which Rent and One is producing um, every year, actually, to, um, to show the advancements uh, we have in renewable energy, and which we have launched internationally yesterday with different events uh, worldwide. Now, before starting to present what, uh, what the Global Stats Report tells us about renewable energy, we'd quickly like to introduce to you what Rent and One is. So, Rent and One, uh, the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st Century, is a global multi stakeholder network which is dedicated to the rapid uptake of renewable energy worldwide. We do speak about ourselves as a coalition of the willing, and we bring together different types of organizations. Um, so international organizations, national governments, industry associations, NGOs, and science and academia. And this multi-stakeholder approach is really something which is, uh, which is, I guess, the, the blood and the heart of Wrench in One, and is reflected very much in all our activities. <clears throat> um, one activity, which is basically our flagship activity, is uh, the Renewables Global Status Report. And this multi-stakeholder approach and this collaborative approach is also reflected very much in the way we are producing this report. The objective of the report is to report annually about the status of renewable energy worldwide without doing a profound, basically, analysis or outlooks, but really, where do we stand? And uh, obviously, uh, where do we stand in terms of reaching the energy transition with renewable energy? Um, the production is building on a community of international experts. There are more than 900 international experts participating in the Global States Report. And um, they can participate as a, yeah, partly authors, uh, regional contributors, thematic contributors, reviewers, and uh, anybody who would be participating, who would want to participate, is really invited to come with us. So there are many opportunities. In the report, we are looking at all renewable energy technologies and all energy sectors, so power, heating, cooling, and transport. Um, considering the fact that renewable energy without energy efficiency will not uh, happen when we're really talking about the transition, we also have a chapter on energy efficiency where we're specifically looking at the interfaces between renewables and energy efficiency. And we also have a specific chapter on uh, energy access, so distribute renewable energy for energy access. So really, how do we also reach not only uh, Paris goals, but uh, the SDG 7? Um, considering the fact that renewable energy is evolving a lot, so this year for, for, for the second year in a row, uh, we have started developing a chapter on energy systems integration and enabling technologies. <coughs> now, looking at 2017, um, the good message is we really have, an, again, an extraordinary year for renewable energy in particular in the power sector, because there have been record installations uh, in renewable power capacity, which are the highest uh, ever. And um, the total global capacity um, has what basically 9% compared to 2016, has risen 9% compared to 2016. 
reaching an installed capacity of 2,195 gigawatts, including launch hydro. Now, um, this is really something which is extremely positive because uh, we see that renewable energy today is cost competitive. And uh, this has been the main driver actually from the, for this renewable energy uptake. It is very clear, however, that uh, the uptake in, in renewables has really been driven mainly by two technologies, in particular solar PV, which accounted for 55% of the newly installed capacity, and wind, which accounted for 29%. Um, there is, however, obviously also hydropower, which accounted for 11%, and biopower, 4.6%. We'll already see these technologies here are all renewable energy or renewable power technologies. So there is a first indication. <laughs> now, when we're looking uh, into this, also in terms of investment, basically, there are very good news on uh, renewable uptake in 2017, because global new investment in renewable power and fuels has risen again by 2% compared to 2016, reaching 280 billion US dollars um, and 320 billion US dollars, including large hydro. So um, that's very good news because the the investment have have increased even though costs have continued to to get down. So this also means that in in relation there is more installed capacity. Now, when we're looking here at, um, at the bar, bar chart, basically, you'll see that in this dark, uh, dark red, this is China. And China is clearly regionally the driver uh, for the renewable energy investment very much. Um, when you see the dark orange, this is developing and emerging countries. And again, for the third year in a row, developing and emerging countries have been, um, have been surpassing basically investment in uh, developed uh, economies. <clears throat> now, um, what is very interesting to see, and that's really good news, that today renewable energy accounted for 68% of total amount committed to new power generating capacity, which means we are reaching um, the situation that renewable power capacity was roughly three times higher than new fossil fuel capacities and more than twice the investment in fossil fuel and nuclear combined. This is very clearly an indication that renewable energy power today is cost competitive. And uh, there are basically two tipping points uh, we typically speak about. The first tipping point is the cost competitiveness when we're comparing renewable energy power to new installed capacity from fossil fuel in this year. And in many regions, or in an increasing number of, uh, of countries, we're, we're going toward the second tipping point, where it is even more cost competitive to invest in new renewable power capacity uh, than operating existing fossil fuel capacities. And that's really something which will have a major impact during the next couple of years on, uh, on the development. When we're looking at the total final energy consumption in 2016, and here we have a 2016 data because there is no more recent data available. It's building on IEA World Energy Statistics. Um, renewable energy provided 18.2% of the global final energy consumption. What is a good, uh, a good information is, or a good development is that uh, modern renewables, uh, which we're aiming for, <laughs> Um, has has provided 10.4 percent, and uh, was basically a slight increase compared to 2015 of 0.2 percent. Traditional biomass represents 7.8 percent, and uh, this was a decrease of uh, minus 2.4 percent compared to 2015. Why is this a good news? Uh, it's a good news because when we're talking about traditional biomass, we're talking about biomass which is basically burned in an inefficient way. Of, very often in developing countries for heating and in particular cooking in open fires. And these have uh, major health impacts, but also environmental impacts. And um, the objective here is really to increase efficiency of uh, these installations, so having increased improved cook stoves, and move basically the traditional biomass part into the modern biomass factory. So it's very good information that the traditional biomass has dropped. The challenge, obviously, is that uh, the overall renewable energy share by this is, in, uh, is decreasing. But um, if 
efficiency increase. So that's good news. Let's look at the power sector. And this is really the sector where renewable uptake has been the most uh, dominant and uh, visible. Um, in 2017, renewables accounted for 70% of net additions to global power generation capacity, and they provided 26.5% of global electricity demand, with hydropower representing 16.4%, wind power 5.6%, Biopower 2.2%, solar PD 1.9%, and ocean CSD and geothermal power 0.4%. This progress um, is a very good indicator. It shows that uh, the transition to renewable energy is possible. Um, and we should really build on this uh, positive message because uh, it can be also replicated uh, in other sectors. When we are looking into the global power capacities, you see here uh, the uptake um, and reaching 2,195 gigawatt of installed capacities in 2017. And here again, you see that the main driver have clearly been wind and especially photovoltaics. Um, let's have a look uh, at solar PV. So solar PV was 98 gigawatt of solar PV capacity have been added in 2017. And this was an increase um, over, over 2016 of 33%. And this is really uh, yeah, a, major, uh, a major uptake, um, especially as it's following already a couple of years where we had a very important growth rate. It's also important to keep in mind that we're talking here about gigawatt, gigawatt hours, etc. This is one parameter. The other parameter is, for example, that uh, this installed capacity represents 30,000 PV panels every hour, every hour. And this means, obviously, creation of jobs, creation of economics, um, etc., which is also a very, um, a very important parameter to take into account when we're talking about this uh, renewable energy transition. Um, on solar PV itself, we had more installed capacities, um, the net capacity additions, compared to the net capacity additions of fossil fuel and nuclear power combined. So that's very uh, indicative. Obviously, China is really a main driver, has been a main driver in 2017, uh, with 53.1 gigawatt added. And um, just uh, to keep in mind, or uh, put it in relation, these 53 gigawatt uh, corresponded to more gigawatt, or to a higher capacity than uh, capacity added worldwide in 2015. Um, as a result, China has reached basically its uh, targets of which they had set uh, for 2020 for solar installations already in 2017. Other leading countries are the US, Japan, India, and um, the rest of the world, uh, plus uh, then the next six countries are Turkey, Germany, Australia, Republic of Korea, United Kingdom, and Britain. Let's move to the other technology which has driven basically the uptake, that's wind power. Um, 52 gigawatt of wind power capacity were added in 2017, increasing uh, this represents the growth compared to 2015 of 11%, reaching total installed capacity of 539 gigawatt. Again, China has lead position for wind, um, adding nearly uh, almost 20 gigawatt and reaching a total of 188 gigawatt. What is interesting in the wind sector is very clearly the developments we also see in the offshore wind sector. So onshore wind clearly represents the majority of installed capacity for wind, but in the offshore wind sector, there was an increase of 30% in the capacity compared to 2016. So we see a very dynamic market. How does this reflect when we're looking at the power grids? So, and this is another good news in the power sector, the electricity grids are able to integrate high shares of variable renewable energy. So when we say variable renewable energy, we refer to photovoltaic, solar PV, and wind power, because their production can vary depending on, um, on the sunshine or the wind resources. 
Now, in Denmark, we have reached uh, a share of variable renewable energy, uh, which is over 55%. Then we have countries which are more around 30%, like Uruguay, Germany, Ireland, Portugal, and then followed by Spain, United Kingdom, Greece, Honduras, and Nicaragua. And that's very, really very good news, because even a couple of years ago, and still in some countries, there, are, there is still this myth that it is not possible to integrate a high share of variable renewable energy. Um, that's one aspect, and we see here these countries really show that it is possible, flexibility solutions do exist. Um, the other good news, and I think it's important uh, to mention Honduras and Nicaragua, is that this is also possible in developing countries. It's not only um, a reality in industrialized countries. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that these countries all had days where they were uh, reaching even higher shares of variable renewables, up to 80%, uh, 90%, etc. So um, a renewable energy transition is possible in the group. Now we are coming to the section where we have less positive messages, but uh, let's keep the good messages of the power sector in mind because we can try to replicate them. Sorry, I, I went too quickly. Let me go back. In the heating and cooling sector, unfortunately, the renewable energy share is much lower. So modern renewable energy share represented 10.3% of the total final energy consumption. Um, the deployment of renewable technologies in heating and cooling is still slow. Uh, biomass has been the main, um, the main contributor. Um, so you see here uh, biomass basically in uh, heat. Um, in buildings, so when we say buildings, we have buildings and residential. Then um, in heat and industry, we still have a share of 6.1%. In transport and electricity, it's different. So uh, let's look at the two left bars. What you see here in the heat, heat uh, in the residential area is that traditional biomass um, represents still 21.8% in the heat sector. And this is really something which uh, we're referring again to this cooking part. So it's in, it's in reduction, but there is still a way to go. Now, what are the challenges in the heat and cooling sector? Um, in 2017, there have still be uh, compared quite low fossil fuel prices uh, compared to previous years. And um, in a sector which is highly dependent on fossil fuels, there are obviously low fossil fuel prices are challenging. But this challenge is even increased by the fact that there is a lack of policy support, but also a lack of uh, creating a level playing field for renewables uh, in this uh, high fossil fuel sector. Maybe to mention a part of biomass, uh, there have been other renewables, in particular solar thermal and geothermal energy, which have uh, been developed. And in solar thermal, um, we see an interesting development, which is also the development of solar thermal, not only for low temperature or in residential applications, but more and more also the development for low and medium temperature application in industry. Um, the situation in the transport sector is unfortunately even more challenging than in the heating and cooling sector. Renewable energy um, only represents 3.1% of um, the total time energy demand consumption in, in the transport sector. And uh, these 3.1% have mainly been provided by, um, by biofuels. In 2017, global biofuels production increased nearly 2.5% to 133 billion liters. So that's basically a good news. I mean, it's going up, but it's not going up quickly enough. Um, another aspect is also that biofuel production and the use is very concentrated geographically. So over 80% of the production takes place in the United States, in the Brazil, and in the European Union. In the transport sector, we do see an interesting trend, and everybody speaks about this, the e-mobility, electrification trend. So this electrification trend uh, does take place in rail and in light rail, where we really have uh, the development of electric uh, um, trains and uh, light metros, etc., and also a very active intake, basically, and development of renewable energy, uh, renewable power in these sectors. 
The other development is clearly the electric vehicles uh, on the roads. And uh, 2017 has been really impressive with regard to this. Uh, electric vehicles on the road passed the 3 million mark in 2017. Um, which is a growth of 70%, so very, very dynamic. It is, however, very important to keep in mind we're talking about only 1% uh, share of the light vehicle market. So we cannot say yet that this electric vehicle development is uh, taking place everywhere. Um, even though this is not the case, uh, there is dynamics which really indicate that this e-mobility, for many reasons, will take place uh, more and more. Um, because electric vehicles are much more cost efficient, they reduce emissions uh, and uh, have a, a local air pollution significantly, and this is a big pressure in particular in, uh, in cities. Um, obviously, they also have no positive impact on uh, the carbon uh, footprint based of transportation. From the energy side, the electric vehicles uh, do allow or do create a new market uh, for renewable energy. Um, for the power, um, but they also, um, there are other synergies because they also facilitate the integration of higher shares of variable renewable energy. So you can use the storage, uh, the batteries basically in the cars for storage, and there are possibilities uh, to offer services to the grid for balancing the grid. Um, and really uh, interesting innovation is taking place on this, also innovation business models, uh, where digitalization obviously is uh, is advancing this. Now you have seen that um, basically the the development of renewable energy in 2017 has been quite different uh, when we're looking at the different sectors, and um, we really need to address this cycle disconnect. And why is that? When you're looking at the power sector, on the right side on the slide you have the blue part, which is electricity. So electricity represents only 20% of the total final energy um, use, only 20%. Whereas heating and cooling and transport represent 80%. So if we really want to make this transition happen, if we want to reach Paris uh, goals and uh, sustainable development goals, we need to transform this electricity, renewable electricity transition into a renewable energy transition. Now, I would like to come to the policies because uh, it is very the uptake of renewable energy in the power sector has been driven by long-term policy support and um, we see that uh, stable long-term policies which allow for investors in industry to really develop their market is something which has been fundamental and is still fundamental in the power sector when we're looking now at the policies um, in the different sectors we do see that the power sectors, we have um, much more policies, basically. Here, I will refer to the targets because they are easier to read. So we had 179 countries with renewable energy targets. 146 countries had power targets. Only 42 countries had transport targets and 48 countries heating and cooling targets. And this really showed that uh, one of the challenges um, in the heating, cooling and transport sector is a lack of policy attention and policies to basically really support the uptake of renewable energy in the sector. Um, interestingly, 2017 has really also, the, the last couple of years already, but in 2017, we had 64 jurisdictions worldwide uh, which had carbon pricing policies. And I'm mentioning these because, for instance, in the heating and cooling sector, carbon pricing is an additional measure um, which is really supporting uh, the uptake of renewable energy. So um, it's also important with, when you're looking at the other sectors, it's also important to start looking not only at pure renewable energy uh, policies, but have a broader approach. So we see, for instance, building codes in the heating sector and residential, which uh, are technology neutral and which allow for basically energy efficient solutions, uh, but also renewable energy development. These are codes which, which can be um, a main driver. Um, carbon pricing policies, and uh, that's something where we'll certainly, we can expect a, a shift also of the policies. Now, um, I have mentioned sector coupling before, and uh, 
this sector coupling is something which is uh, fundamental in the energy transition. And um, we see basically policies arising uh, here on the sector coupling. However, I'm, I'm taking here the example specifically of uh, renewable energy and electric vehicles. What we do see is um, that only a limited example exists for policies that encourage and mandate the use of renewable energy and electric vehicles. At the national level, we have only identified Austria and Germany, even though um, it's also to mention that uh, this is something which is currently being discussed uh, at the European level. So what I'm referring to here is, for instance, subsidies for electric vehicles, uh, which are then bound to um, subscribing to uh, renewable energy power purchase agreement, as one example. Um, there is obviously another way to support uh, this uptake is when uh, countries which have electric mobility targets and uh, have in parallel also renewable energy power targets or renewable targets, this may encourage the use of renewable energy in deployment and transport. However, there are certainly ways to really uh, push for this more. In these sectors, and I would really like to underline this, we do see that um, new policy players uh, come, come start playing an increasing role. I mean, they've always played the role, but we see an increasing role of subnational governments and of cities. As an example, there are hundreds of jurisdictions committed to 100% renewable energy or electricity by end 2017. And here I only mentioned three country examples, but we really see this as a development worldwide. In Japan, municipal leaders released the Nagano Declaration to work together towards 100% renewable energy across the country. Um, more than 250 US mayors committed uh, to a goal of 100% renewables by 2035. And in Germany, over 150 districts, municipalities, regional associations, and cities committed to 100% renewables by the end of 2017 through 100% renewable energy resource network. So um, it's new players, basically. Um, there is another form of new players, and uh, we have a feature, a specific feature in this report this year, which are corporate sourcing, which are the corporations. This feature is specifically on corporate sourcing of renewable energy. Um, it has been produced uh, in collaboration with the building on IRENA's um, analysis. And interestingly, there were, as end of 2017, corporations had actively sourced 465 terawatt hour of renewable electricity across 75 countries. And when you look at this map here, you see that it's not only um, industrialized countries, but that this sourcing also takes place in developing and emerging countries. What is important, why is this taking place? A, it's cost reasons, but it's not only cost reasons. It's, it's energy security, it's resilience, um, it's um, long-term visibility on energy prices, so there are many drivers. And we see that basically the drivers are not anymore linked uh, to corporate social responsibility, but are really, uh, yes, a real corporate sourcing um, decisions. The IT sector purchased the largest amount of renewable energy through wind power and solar PV public, uh, sorry, um, power purchase agreements. In this context, just because I feel it's really important also to see the role these players play. So there were 130 corporations that joined the RE100 initiative. So corporations working together towards 100% renewable energy. Now, we have heard about this uh, sectoral disconnect. Um, what we also observe is that basically the uptake of renewables um, differs in depending on the regions. So when you're looking on the upper right part in blue, you will see uh, the situation in Europe. And here we have a decline of uh, renewable energy investment of approximately 80%. Um, when you go below, you see China, and here we have an increase, a significant increase over 2016, um, still an increase also over 2015. Um, so China is the driving force. 
When we're looking at the rest of uh, Asia, so India um, has also gone down, but uh, is still uh, significant. When we are looking at the rest of Asia and Oceania, uh, we do see that investments are going down. So also in Asia, there is really um, big differences depending on where you look. The situation in Africa and Middle East is uh, more stable compared to 2016. There is a slight uptake. Um, Brazil, slight uptake also in, uh, in the US and uh, Americas. Um, in the US, there has been a decrease in terms of, uh, of investment, but an increase in terms of installed capacity. Um, and that's really something which uh, I think shows that there are driving markets. But it also showed that um, things are not going quick enough. Basically, I'm not sure that, uh, or I'm pretty sure that today we cannot afford that uh, the investment levels are are only slightly increasing in some regions, which are still facing empty access challenges, or we still have a very very high share of fossil fuel and nuclear energy. When we're looking at the renewable energy champions, uh, we're looking at the investment. So we have the leading countries, China, United States, Japan, India, and Germany. And I really like this slide because I feel that uh, it also shows that sometimes it's very good to also look at other indicators. So below in the second line, in the second row, you have the investment in renewable power and fuels per unit of uh, gross domestic product. And here we have very different uh, leading countries, Marshall Islands, Rwanda, Solomon Islands, Guinea-Bissau, and Serbia. And I feel that it's something which is important to mention because uh, even though these countries would not appear on the top five, top ten countries, they are still investing and make major efforts and often even higher effort than the developing and the top leading countries we are seeing before. And um, it is important to also look at these efforts and um, showcase what is ongoing here, make it visible and share it so that uh, the message is also um, yeah, being seen and their experiences can be can be replicated. Also because uh, there is a general assessment that uh, many innovations will probably not come from um, the historic leaders. So it's really important to also observe what is ongoing in these countries. Also, looking at these countries is in particular important uh, because often and we also talk about countries which are still facing uh, another challenge, which is not only um, the share of renewable energy or the, the uh, but they are facing the situation that they still have many people living without energy access and without electricity access. So worldwide, there were in 2016, I think, uh, 1.06 billion people still without electricity access. This represents 14% of the global population, 14%. When you're looking to the right figure, um, you will see that uh, we have uh, different uh, different developments per region. So basically, there is a world total. Um, where we see on the left side, there is the electricity access. And here, from 26, uh, 2010 to 2016, there is a positive trend. So the um, access change was of minus 24%, so um, positive. Even if we also take into account the population increase, where we have a plus 7.4%. Um, when we're looking at Asia, um, the situation is quite balanced, also with regard to the improvement on energy access compared to population change. There is one region which is extremely challenging, and this is Sub-Saharan Africa where basically uh, the electricity uh, change was of only 1%, um, but the population growth is of plus 18%. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. We need not only to think about uh, carbon emissions, but also uh, sustainable development goals and reaching universal energy and energy access. Renewable energy already play a major role here, and that's really something to Keep in mind, it's not that we do not have the solution. Renewable energy, uh, 266 gigawatt of grid connected renewable power capacity exists in these countries. And also there is distributed renewable energy systems, so solar home systems, mini grid, solar lanterns, which provide power to 360 million people. 
um, when we're looking at solar lanterns, for instance, uh, between 2010 and 2017, there was an annual market growth of 60%. So that's very positive, and it's a dynamic market. It's also a market which represents uh, basically uh, opportunities for in, yeah, economic developments and investments. Um, it is, however, clear that more investment is needed. When we're looking at different assessments to reach universal energy access from IEA and SC for all, uh, there is an assessment that 45 to 50, 56 billion US dollars are needed annually to reach this. So we are, there's still a long way to go, let's say. Um, when you're looking uh, then at the global investment and in off-grid solar PV companies, uh, we do see that uh, in 2017, that's an estimate, uh, we reached 284 million US dollars. Um, but we see compared to 2016 that uh, the investment has gone down. And again, <laughs> we need to ask our, ourselves the question, can we afford this? Um, distributed renewables for energy access is not only electricity access, but also energy access for everything which is clean to still. In 2016, uh, only an estimated 29% of the 30.8 million clean food stuff distributed use renewable fuels. And why that is, there is A, a big focus on improved food stuffs. Um, sorry, no, I'm stepping back. So why this, uh, it's uh, that uh, for health reason and the clear pressure, there is a fuel switch which is taking place to LPG and gas. Um, and that's important because the health impacts are major and uh, uh, LPG and gas allow to address these. However, uh, renewable energy uh, still plays a role for 29% and offers opportunities. We have on the yellow one that's a wood and charcoal. So here we are really speaking about improved cook stoves using, uh, using biomass. Um, so they are much more efficient. Um, followed then by biogas with 3.5%, uh, in particular developed in Asia, but also development in Africa. Then solar energy 0.4% and electricity 0.1%. Now, um, it's, in, it's interesting to look basically at the different trends which have uh, an impact on renewable energy uptake. So we do see, and uh, I know this slide is a bit more complicated, but uh, this yellow line basically, we have the modern renewable energy uptake, and we have a growth rate here of the last 10 years of plus 5.4 percent. Traditional biomass was of plus 0.2 percent, and uh, the combined renewables plus 2.3 percent. Now. Even though we have an uptake of 5.4% in modern renewables, this uh, did not allow to counterbalance basically other development, which is A, the increasing demand um, of total final energy, which was a plus 1.7%, and it's driven mainly by economic development in developing countries, emerging economies. Um, also, as I had mentioned before, and there is still investment ongoing in fossil fuel and nuclear energy of plus 1.6 percent. And uh, then there is the part on traditional biomass um, where we see this, this move and that's uh, why the total, uh, the total renewable energy share um, is not increasing at the same pace as the 5.4 percent. And um, 2017 was uh, unfortunately a challenging year with regard to, uh, to CO2 or energy related CO2 emissions because for the first time in four years the emissions rose again and this decoupling of uh, energy demand and energy related CO2 emissions compared to um, the economic development or uh, yeah, uh, did not take place. I feel that it's, uh, we're talking about the status here. Um, in this status report, we're also looking at uh, renewable energy targets. And I think it's something which is uh, interesting also when we're thinking about, a bit about the future, because uh, we all have ideas and imagine the future. Clearly at Brenton One, we imagine the future with uh, many, many renewable energy. <laughs> and uh, when you're looking here at the slide, it's a bit complicated again. 
But on the top, you do have the heating and cooling. Um, on the right top, transport, and on the low part, the power targets. So you see the time scale. So for instance, for heating and cooling, you see many countries have targets for 2020 and two countries for 2030. Um, and here, what are the targets? We do have targets which reach from a couple of percent for 2020 to over 60 percent. And this is something which is realistic when we're looking, for instance, to Scandinavia. They have uh, renewable energy heating shares which are already exceeding 60 percent. Looking at the countries, and it's interesting, looking at the countries for 2030 in heating and cooling, um, they are both below 10%. On transfer, the maximum we are reaching is between 20 and 40% as you see. And when we are looking now at the lower part, we, which is the power sector, A, we see that the projections go, uh, people imagine realities uh, until 2050. So that's really something which is uh, quite different. We also see that there is a big variability um, on the target setting, but we do see clearly that for the power sector, many policymakers can imagine that we are going towards a high renewable power share uh, reality in the power sector. And uh, the whole objective, I think, is to also uh, see hopefully very soon such realities in heating and cooling and the transport sector. But it also means that we need this policy attention. Now, I'm coming to my concluding slides, and slide and will then be <laughs> available, obviously, for questions. So I would really like to um, take this encouraging uh, last slide in the power sector and saying, yes, um, the transition is possible. And this is basically what the power sector shows us. The transition is possible uh, because there is advancing record capacity addition and still rapidly falling costs. It's really a reality. Um, the progress is, however, not fast enough um, and it's not spreading in all sectors. And we just don't have the time. If we want to reach Paris Agreement goals and SDGs, we don't have the time. We need to move now. And that's really something important. And to do this, we need to address basically the other energy sectors. Um, and they need, they need to be policy attached. But also development of, uh, of technological solutions when we're talking about uh, the transport sector, for instance, in shipping and aviation, um, or in long haul transportation, in heating and cooling, um, there needs to be, yeah. Also, the industry is needed, cities are needed, um, behavior change is needed, so uh, let's work together. Um, it's very clear also on the sector that um, in view of this energy transition, there needs to be a better integrated sector planning and um, also a better integrated design of policies and regulatory frameworks. This is fundamental. We are today really going to, um, to a situation where uh, the integration of heating and cooling and transport into the power sector uh, can offer major um, opportunities for, for all sectors and uh, the policies and regulatory frameworks need to adapt to this. In the systems approach, there is clearly a need to link energy efficiency and renewable energy more. And uh, in particular, and this is valid for all renewable energy or for, en for all energy sector, but in particular for heating, cooling and transport, which are highly developed, uh, highly de dependent on fossil fuels, they, we need to have a level playing field for renewables. Um, there is still subsidies uh, for fossil fuels and nuclear with between three to five times um, the support which is existing for renewable energy still today. When we are thinking about the energy access, we also need a level playing field between decentralized off-grid renewables and uh, centralized grid-connected um, solutions, um, because these decentralized off-grid renewables offer major opportunities um, and need to um, evolve basically in a market space, which also take them seriously, I guess, and give them the opportunity to evolve. Another aspect is uh, when we are looking basically at, uh, at um, cities, when we're looking at uh, developing countries, when we're looking all the, at all the innovation which is done 
in startups, uh, innovation business models, technology innovations in governments, etc. There is many, many things happening, but they are not always visible because they are not always consolidated. And um, this is really an invitation to everybody to use basically this renewable global status report platform where our objective is to really show what is ongoing in the field, to complement also um, the official statistics, which uh, might not always capture um, the realities uh, on the ground. With this, uh, I'm closing my presentation for on the Global Safety Report. Um, here's a slide with all our different activities. I'm uh, specifically pointing, just because I'm sitting in Manila for the moment, uh, I'm pointing to uh, the next International Renewable Energy Conference, which will take place from 23rd to 26th October in 2019. And if you want to access the report, download uh, the infographics, press releases, etc., just visit our website. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much for that outstanding presentation. Uh, we are going to shift to the Q&A. And I'd like to remind our uh, attendees to please submit questions using the question pane at any time. We are going to keep up several links on the screen throughout for a quick reference that point to where you'll find uh, information about other upcoming and previously held webinars and how to take advantage of the Ask an Expert program. We've had some great questions from the audience that we'll use the remaining time to discuss and answer. Um, our first question today is, what do your results show, or what about the situation of renewables in Costa Rica? And I think you may be on mute, Rana. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm, I'm on mute again. Okay, I didn't see this. No worries. Um, yes, <laughs> so you did not hear my enthusiasm in the mic when I said uh, so uh, Costa Rica is a very interesting case um, study, and I think we can really um, learn from this example and uh, draw lessons from this example. In Costa Rica, there is a very high share of renewable energy power, and um, there has been a support uh, which was really spread also to the population in Costa Rica uh, to see um, how renewable can really help to become uh, yeah, to reach energy security, uh, self-sufficiency, etc. And Costa Rica has, I'm not sure whether we had 100% renewable electricity, but close to 100% renewable electricity. Um, also because obviously they do have very good uh, uh, resources and hydropower. This plays obviously a role. But um, what is really interesting in Costa Rica is um, that they have really managed, this country has managed to make renewable energy part of the country's culture, I guess, and identity. And as a result, for instance, they are now um, pushing for the electrification of the transport sector um, with renewable energy power. And this is something which is, uh, which is fabulous, but it, it also shows that uh, basically this renewable energy transition is also an opportunity for, um, for building this new, uh, yeah identities, um, local identities, local economies, uh, involving communities, um, creating governance, uh, other governance models in the energy sector. So definitely a country to look at and to uh, learn how they have um, basically contributed or managed this behavior change, which is also something which is important, especially when we're looking at transport, when we're looking at energy efficiency. Um, the behavior change of end users is very important. Wonderful. Thank you for answering that. Our next question is, how do you assure the um, credibility or the accuracy of the data you gather and present in these reports? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, a, that's a very interesting question. And uh, we do have, um, as mentioned, I mean, this is building on a, on a community basically of 800 experts. I'd say these experts uh, can differ very much. So we have uh, from a student doing master's study in the region <laughs> to uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency or the International Energy Agency, uh, country contributions from ministries, uh, industry associations uh, like IHA, GVAC, VIDEA, um, research institutes contributing. So it's very heterogeneous. Now, we also have a um, 
to to validate this so how does this work we're collecting all this data um complementing it obviously with desk research there is an authoring team who will then produce graphs for the different chapters which we are making available in peer review and um, during this peer review basically we have kind of a validation of the data um, and in the peer review i think that for each peer review round we probably have something like uh, between 100 and 150 uh, players or experts participating in this review then obviously when we're um, in our in our fine tuning i think of the data we're also working with other data experts to see what they think about it, uh, the analysts and, uh, and the international NG agency, IRENA, and the different industry associations to really make sure that our data is coherent. When we're looking, and uh, some partners have done this, analyze basically the global state report data compared to official statistics which have been published, and uh, apparently we are not so much of that, so that's a good move. Great, thank you. Our next question is, can you please explain um, what are modern renewables versus combined? Oh, yes, this is referring to this last slide. So the combined renewables is basically when we are speaking about renewable energy, modern plus traditional biomass. This is the combined renewables. So we do see an uptake of modern renewable energy of plus 5.4% of traditional biomass of plus 0.2 percent and combined of two uh, plus two point i think three percent if i'm not mistaken so it's really the all renewable energy so including modern renewables and traditional biomass thank you our next question we have some great questions coming in from the audience so thank you everyone all the attendees our next question is um, is firm level data on renewable investment available for REN21? Um, if I understand the question correctly, um, so the investment data um, from the Global States Report is basically building on the data which is produced in the um, Global Trends Report on Renewable Energy Investment, which is produced uh, together by the UNAB and Frankfurt School uh, Collaborating Center and Bloomberg New Energy Finance. This year, for the first time, we have started integrating additional data because uh, um, the NEF data is focusing more on the power sector and or solely on the power sector and the fuel sector. And we feel that there is really a need to increase basically the investment or the availability of investment data also on the heating sector. This is certainly something which will take some time to build up, but it's very important also to attract the interest of policymakers, but also investors uh, to these and the other energy sectors. So if there's anybody listening here who might have good insights or data, please be in touch. Great, thank you so much. Our next attendee asks, to what degree are relatively mature uh, power markets looking for other technologies such as large capacity built batteries and hydrogen for sector coupling to further support integration of renewable energy. And is renewable energy starting to hit a, a wall in capacity feeding in Europe? Um, so these countries, uh, so, so basically we're speaking about markets where we already have um, comparatively high shares of renewable energy where we have, uh, like in Europe, uh, also an electricity um, grid which um, is existing and uh, has been built around centralized solutions. There is very clearly a um, trend in these countries to look basically into flexibility options, in general flexibility options. Um, and that's also why uh, also a situation we had in China. China has, for instance, last year invested less in renewable power capacities but has invested in transmission uh, lines um, and interconnection um, because these were also necessary to integrate more uh, renewable energy um, capacity. So um, this is one part they are looking into. They are clearly looking into uh, storage here. Um, and yes, I'm sorry for this. I forgot to include the slide on the storage. Uh, but when we're looking at storage, we really see an uptake uh, clearly of storage. The main storage is provided by pump storage. Then there is thermal storage. And uh, then we have battery storage. Um, 
when we're looking at the sector coupling, for instance, for transport or also in the heating sector with uh, high temperature applications, um, in transport in particular, all the, so, because I spoke about the electrification here, but there is the other possibility, which is the possibility to use renewable energy power to produce synthetic fuels. So, for instance, in, uh, in different hydrogen pathways, ammonia, um, and here um, there is, we do have different trends, I'm, uh, but there is a clear, I think it's very clear that for some energy sectors, uh, the full electrification is not an option or not an option yet. So when we're thinking about shipping or uh, aviation, long haul uh, transport, um, high temperature uh, needs basically in industry, um, high temperature heat needs in industry, and um, hydrogen is definitely a technology which is one of the solutions. Thank you. Our and next question. Sorry, maybe to complement um, this, uh, because it also allows uh, to provide these sectors with renewable fuel, but obviously um, it's also a possibility to transform uh, renewable power, which is being produced, into fuel which can be stored more easily. Great, thank you. Our next question is, what are the financial incentives available in investing renewable in renewable energy? Oh, this it depends very much on um, on the country, basically, on the country's policies. Uh, there are different, uh, different uh, support schemes which do exist in the power sector. We see, for instance, uh, a very, for a long time, we had feed-in tariffs which were a main driver. Um, last year, there have been two countries which have uh, adopted the feed-in tariff scheme. I think it was Vietnam and, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Zambia. Um, but in the power sector, for instance, we see since a couple of years of development uh, that there is more and more auctions. Uh, just because renewable energy power today is cost competitive and auctions allow to um, develop large, uh, large capacities on the one side, but also uh, reach low energy prices. Um, so it basically depends on the bid which is uh, provided by the industry. Um, so that's really uh, a big trend we can see. As I mentioned, uh, carbon pricing, for instance, relevant in heating and cooling. There's subsidies, rebates, detaxation. Um, when you look at the report, there is a policy table and also reference tables which will give an overview about the policy situation and uh, in every country. I am sorry, I don't have all of them in mind, so. <laughs> no worries, thank you for answering that. Um, we have time for a couple of more. Um, our next question is, what is the current role of solar thermal, oops, sorry, I lost the question. Um, what is the current role of solar thermal energy compared with other alternatives? And what is the forecast evolution in this sector? Um, so solar thermal has been um, the last year is a bit under pressure because uh, of the low photovoltaic. Um, so in general, the thermal applications of thermal renewable energy have been a bit under pressure because of the low um, photovoltaic uh, prices in particular. And uh, this has slowed down the solar thermal market. However, as I mentioned, we do see an innovation here uh, which is taking place, and this is really the development of larger solar thermal plants, um, and also uh, the application in for for industries uh, in um, medium term medium temperature uh, applications. Uh, when it comes to the projections, I'm I'm really sorry, I'm <laughs> I could not tell you what the projections are for the solar thermal market, but. Uh, Please don't hesitate to drop me an email and I'll put you in touch with uh, our solar thermal experts and uh, offering team. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had several attendees ask uh, questions about the transportation sector, specifically in the um, maritime and air um, transportation sectors. What are the alternatives are being foreseen and what are policy steps that are taking regarding these two sectors um, in transportation? 
So, um, to be honest, so shipping and aviation are certainly uh, two um, quite challenging sectors when it comes to uh, decarbonization and development of renewable energy. There are different reasons for this. One reason is uh, these sectors are highly dependent on fossil fuels, but uh, not only <laughs> these sectors, uh, because they are also internationally coordinated by the International Marine Organ uh, Organization. Um, and uh, the International Council on, sorry, ICAO, so it's UN organizations, UN bodies, um, there needs to be an international consensus. And in many countries, basically, um, these sectors uh, have, in addition, a detaxation of the fossil fuels. So we have a challenging situation with regard to this. There is, however, also a challenging situation when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the technology solutions which do exist, because these are sectors which are difficult to electrify. So the main solutions we can see here is clearly um, biofuels is an option and it's being developed, so advanced biofuels. Um, and uh, they are for the moment being used as drop-in fuels, which means that there are parts, fuels are being, uh, a, a share of uh, biofuels is being added to uh, the normal um, fossil fuels. Um, Another aspect is, in particular in aviation, there is also a very, is a need for a stable, uh, a stable fuel, actually. And uh, this is where we see really the development or what are the technology solutions which do exist. Um, it's very clearly uh, the development of advanced uh, synthetic fuels. So where renewable energy power is being trans transformed uh, into into, for instance, hydrogen, ammonia, um, into synthetic fuels, which can then be used in the normal combustion engines. So um, these are probably the most uh, promising parts. Um, there is also hydrogen itself being developed for maritime. And what we do see um, is in, in shipping um, that, uh, sorry, in the maritime sector, Actually, I have a doubt whether in English it's maritime or marine, but uh, yeah, you understand what I'm talking about. Sorry for that. Um, but uh, here we also see that there have been the first uh, electric ferries existing. So when we're talking more about domestic uh, marine sector, um, there is the other possibility to also integrate uh, solar PV, obviously, and uh, wind uh, in the shipping sector. Thank you very much. Our next question is um, about auctions. What are the different auction models and what is the current trend for that area? Um, okay, for the auctions, I, I, it would be great if you could send me the, uh, the email of the person who has asked this because uh, I would prefer to get back with details. Um, in principle, what we see is that there is a very clearly um, the trend towards auctions, uh, because uh, they allow to, as I mentioned before, to increase uh, or to build basically large uh, capacities and reach lower prices uh, through bids. Um, what is interesting here is, I mean, one of the markets or, or the impact we see on auctions is uh, that, um, and there has also been pushback in particular of uh, project developers who are developing more community-based uh, projects and small-scale projects. So auctions, the result of auctions is that uh, you, the bids often come from larger players. Uh, we're looking at larger capacities. And uh, for instance, for Latin America, when 21 has produced the last year a report on uh, the tendering system, so the auction system, and uh, community empowerment and our recommendation or the recommendation of this report, uh, which is building on interviews and research uh, for Latin America, was to have one part of the auction system uh, which is reserved basically for community-based um, community uh, and lower uh, scale or smaller projects because these one cannot compete with larger projects, but are fundamental as, for instance, the example of Costa Rica shows, are fundamental for the energy transition. But please send me the contacts and I'll, uh, I'll uh, put you in touch with the experts on that topic. Absolutely, we will, um, for any questions that we do not get to today, we will definitely um, 
connect with those attendees offline um, after the webinar. Um, our next question is a two-part question. What are examples of national policies in developing countries that have unlocked corporate renewable energy procurement, and what is needed in developed countries to advance the transition? Okay. So um, one fundamental thing when we're looking at corporate sourcing um, is very clearly uh, often the possibility uh, to allow for um, legally allow or or make the independent power production legal. So it's a liberalization of the energy market, uh, which is fundamental. Um, access to the grid um, and the authorization to be allowed to sell electricity. So this is uh, some basic needs in the regulatory framework. Um, Unless uh, basically you have uh, corporations who would directly invest in their own production capacities and would only consume them themselves, which is also existing very often when you're looking into the mining sector, the development of mini grids, uh, pulp and paper, um, uh, wastewater treatment plants, etc., breweries. Um, many of these sectors already have their own uh, renewable energy capacity. Now, what is needed in developing countries? Um, clearly, as uh, similar to this, I mean, the market, uh, the regulatory framework uh, for uh, the energy market, that's one aspect. In developing countries, we see very often a uh, high subsidization of fossil fuels. And um, this is the situation which is challenging, and also still at taxes, which are not in favor of renewable energy development. Um, what is also needed in developing countries is the investment in capacity building. It's fundamental um, to develop uh, sustainable markets. Uh, there is a need for institutional capacity. There is a need for technicians, etc. So uh, that's another part which is important. Great, thank you so much. Um, our final question is, what does your findings show, or what does REN21 show, um, find as the biggest barrier that is faced as we move forward in renewable energy? Hmm. <laughs> I would say, um, yeah, probably the level playing field still, because uh, we're talking about renewable energy technologies which are or are close to be cost competitive, but which are not operating, still not operating in an environment which uh, allows them to really be cost competitive. That's one thing. The other one I feel is a change of perception. Uh, there are still many myths out there. Um, uh, myths on renewable energy is too expensive. It's only for OECD countries. Um, we're making the grid. Uh, it's not possible to have high share of variable renewable energy in a grid without uh, having a negative impact on grid stability. Um, and uh, this is something which, uh, which is important to address by information, knowledge creation, education, capacity building um, in the countries, but also in the different organizations, in the banks, in the finance sector. Um, it's fundamental because all these players are needed to really make this transition happen. And uh, to do this, um, and I think the renewable energy power sector has really shown it. It is important to develop uh, good uh, and stable and long-term uh, policy and regulatory framework. That's fundamental. The good news is there are many good examples. And um, I attended uh, I attended a um, conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, like, when they have developed uh, the California uh, framework, for instance. They did not start to invent uh, all the things themselves. They looked what was working in other countries and tried to analyze it and transpose it to the Californian context. And I feel that this is something which is the very good news. I mean, we do have the solutions. It's not about lacking solutions. It's not about lacking good entry points, but it's more about really um, getting these information to decision makers, getting these information in good energy planning tools, in good investment analysis, etc., and really take into account the significant cost reductions we have, the fact that uh, the technology risks are much lower than they are partly still assessed uh, by by uh, some countries, uh, sorry, by investors or commercial banks, 
And um, all this comes down to information and capacity building, awareness raising. Um, yes. Thank you again for that um, informative question and answer session. For, like I said, for any questions we didn't have time to get to, we'll connect with those attendees offline after the webinar. Now I'd like to provide um, Rana with um, uh, an opportunity to um, have some additional or closing remarks before we close the webinar. Okay. What, yes, uh, Rana, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I'm very happy uh, that I had this opportunity. Thank you for this. Um, I'm really inviting anybody who might be on the other screen, and that's always a challenge on the webinars, but the great uh, advantage is we can reach out to people we might not meet at some conferences, but really don't hesitate to get engaged in this process. It is a collaborative process. There is an expert community. We're keen on uh, on um, illustrating uh, good examples uh, which uh, might be more local and not always seen globally. So uh, don't hesitate to participate and share your insights and knowledge to make this transition happen. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you again. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend a thank um, a thank you to our wonderful expert speaker and to all of our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate your time and hope in return there are some valuable insights that you can take back to your ministries, departments, or organizations. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solution Center resources and services, including our no-cost policy support through the Ask an Expert service. I invite you to check the Solutions Center website if you'd like to view the slides and listen to the recording of today's presentation, as well as previously held webinars. Additionally, you'll find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We're now posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Please allow about a week for the posting to occur. Finally, I'd like to kindly ask you to take a moment to complete a short survey that will appear when we conclude the webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at uh, future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our.